ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for checking out my YouTube channel today, The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. I am your host, as always, Nick Barksdale, and today we are joined by a very special guest, Dr. Andrew Latham. Latham, thank you so much for coming on today. My pleasure. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Yes, uh, I am a professor of international relations at McAllister College. Uh, which is in St. Paul, Minnesota. I've been here for about 23 years. And over those 23 years, my research interests have evolved. But in the last 10 or 12 years, I've really been focused on the medieval uh, international system. And I've written a book to that effect uh, on that topic. And actually written a novel as well called The Holy Lance, which deals with, with uh, King Richard the Lionheart, kind of making use of some of the stuff that I learned while I was doing the more boring academic research. <laughs> And I teach courses on medieval political thought and international conflict. Uh, I'm kind of all over the place these days. But I'm really, really enthusiastic about getting the word out about the Crusades. I think people misunderstand them to some extent and in various ways, uh, especially in this era when one can be accused rather of Islamophobia at the drop of a hat. It's not really about that. And, and making sure that the truth kind of gets out. So Nick's enterprise here is really congenial to that project. And to my subscribers, definitely check out the links in the video description below. Buy a copy, give him your support. Honestly, I can't wait to get started. We've got a series lined up for you on the Crusades. I can't wait to explore this through the guidance of Dr. Latham. Dr. Latham, I'm going to let you take it from here. Now, again, as uh, I want to um, make reference to that great Crusades historian, uh, Jonathan Riley Smith, and he argued that following the birth of the crusading movement um, during the First Crusade, launched in 1095 and successfully liberating slash capturing Jerusalem in 1099, um, the history of the Crusades to the Holy Land can be divided into several discrete phases. Now, the first of these, from about 1102 to 1187, he describes that uh, as crusading in its adolescence. So we have the birth and the childhood to stretch the metaphor perhaps beyond what it can bear uh, with the original conquest uh, slash liberation of Jerusalem, but also setting up the crusader kingdoms, etc. That was the birth phase. And now we're in the adolescent phase from 1102 it's an important date because one of the Crusader principalities falls, Edessa, on Christmas Day in the year 1102, which had huge significance and resonance back in, uh, back in the Latin Christian uh, hinterland. Between that date and 1187, when Jerusalem fell to Saladin, this is called by Riley Smith the uh, crusading period, sorry, the adolescent period of crusading. And during this phase, phase rather, the church the, the, and the crusader principalities were forced on the defensive. So the initial or opening or birth phase is one of the crusaders, the Latin Christians being on the offensive, even though they framed it as a defensive war, they took the fight to the Holy Land. Um, after the fall of Edessa, which was an important um, uh, outpost of the defensive ring around Jerusalem, uh, they were increasingly on the defensive against an increasingly unified Islamic um, empire, uh, most famously in its latter days under Saladin, um, committed to the reconquest of Jerusalem and the extirpation or elimination of the Christian presence in Syria and Palestine. Now, it's important to recall that, that Islam, um, that Muslim political authorities had been in charge of the Holy Land for several centuries at this point. It did have spiritual significance to them. It wasn't as important as Mecca or Medina, but it was, it was next in line in terms of importance. Um, and so they were loath to simply walk away and let the Crusaders have their way. Um, it became a rallying cry in a very discordant and uh, divided Islamic world that allowed leaders like Saladin to actually bring the Islamic world together uh, in ways that hadn't been the case in 1095, for example. 
And on that score, one might ask why the First Crusade was as successful as it was. They really were fighting against the odds. Um, and of course, in their minds, it was a miracle um, that God had decided that he was going to restore the Holy Land to the Christians. Now, some of us, I think, would still accept that explanation, but others of us would want something a little more material and perhaps even this worldly historical. And the answer there is that the Islamic world was divided. There was disunity and internecine conflict when the Crusaders arrived. Um, and indeed, as I've written in several places, uh, this persisted, this was the, the factory setting in the Islamic world. Um, and it was only under ex extraordinary leaders like Saladin that uni unity became possible and only for limited periods of time. Now, um, that phenomenon of discord and division also characterized the crusader states once they were established, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, in an era in which dynastic competition was important, in an era in which land was the primary source, peasants really, the peasants working the land was the primary source of wealth. Uh, as a political leader, as a prince or a king, you wanted more land. And there's only one way you could get more land, to take it from somebody else, whether they were Christian or Muslim or pagan or what have you. Um, so there is discord and disunity on both sides, punctuated by short periods of unity and harmony. Um, but really what's going on is Christians are playing the Muslim polities off against one another and vice versa. And you get some very strange alliances across the civilizational divide. You get, in fact, Christian um, political units and princes siding with Muslims against other Christians and vice versa. So it's not simply a matter of uh, a clash of civilizations, to use a modern term. It really was uh, politics as usual, for the most part, except periodically when Muslims were able to unify and launch a jihad or when Christians were able to unify and launch a crusade. Okay, almost immediately after the loss of Jerusalem, uh, Muslim opposition began to coalesce. Egyptian forces, for example, attempted to re retake Jerusalem as early as 1099, as did those of the Sultanate of Iraq beginning in the year 1110. And ominously from the church's perspective, an increasingly unified Muslim state centered on Mosul and Aleppo began to coalesce in, 1120, in the 1120s. And when a new governor, who goes by the name of uh, Zengi, was appointed in 1128, he and his newly unified emirate um, embarked on a series of campaigns intended to further extend what had become his personal domain at the expense of both his Christian and his Muslim neighbors. So Zengi, is committed to extending, enlarging, expanding his empire. And he really doesn't care at whose expense that takes place, Christians or Muslims. Now, um, I mentioned earlier 1120 is the date when Edessa fell. I misremembered that, of course, as everybody knows, it was actually 1144. Um, and the Count of Edessa entered into a defensive alliance with one of Zengi's Muslim adversaries. And uh, Zengi sensed an opportunity and attacked Edessa. And Edessa became the cap was the capital of the First Crusader Principality once the Crusaders arrived in the Holy Land. It was a cornerstone of the strategic defenses of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Think of Jerusalem in the center and these other principalities surrounding it as kind of a... Uh, an outer line of defense. And Edessa was crucially important, a linchpin, a cornerstone, a foundation, pick your metaphor. But it fell to Zengi's forces, as I said earlier, getting the day correct, Christmas, and the year incorrect. It was in fact 1144. Almost as soon then as they had taken Jerusalem in 1099, the crusader leadership realized that if the Holy Land were to be made secure, it would be necessary to create precisely that kind of defensive buffer around Jerusalem, around Jerusalem rather, to which I have just uh, made reference. 
In addition to an outer and inner ring formed by the principalities founded during the First Crusade, this would require an outer ring comprising the key strategic towns of Ascalon, Aleppo, Damascus, and the Mediterranean ports. Uh, the Mediterranean was a key lifeline for the Crusaders. It was, for the most part, dominated and controlled by Latin Christian navies. And it was the preferred route for trade. And remember the Crusader kingdoms too are now located um, in between Latin Christendom on the one hand and everything to the east up to and including China um, on the other. So it's an important, um, uh, important way station in those trade routes. It's, it's crucially important that we bear that in mind as well. This wasn't just spiritual, but what was that? These Crusades had some um, material underpinnings as well. As Thomas Aquinas said many years later, if you want to understand why people do what they do, you only need to understand that human beings pursue power, they pursue wealth, they pursue glory, and they pursue pleasure. And all of those, uh, those motivating factors are at work in the Crusades and in the, uh, and in the counter-Crusades, the Jihad as well. Following the fall of Edessa then, on, for, on 1 December 1145, Pope Eugenius III reacted to this very unwelcome and scary development by issuing a general letter, the bull entitled Quantum Predecessores. Uh, my Latin isn't what it once was. Uh, which called for a second crusade to fight in defense of the Holy Land. Now, now remember, they, the institution of the crusade hasn't been well established. There was one. It was, it was successful. The Crusaders achieved what they'd hoped to achieve, liberating Jerusalem. And in the minds of many Latin Christians, that was the beginning and the end of it. And so when Pope Eugenius calls for another crusade, people are left, at least metaphorically, scratching their heads, although given the prevalence of lice in those days, they probably were literally scratching their heads as well. And there was a very poor initial response uh, to uh, the Pope's call. Um, so he reissued the encyclical in March of 1146 and had somebody who became a very important figure in the history of the uh, Christian slash Catholic Church, the abbot Bernard of Clairvaux, and he charged him with preaching the crusade in France and Germany. And it was, he was amazingly successful in terms of ginning up interest in this, uh, in this new crusade. In addition to calling on the armed laity, um, which is the average, uh, both the average person and the knightly class, to take the cross, which is what crusading was called at the time, one took the cross, and come to the aid of their besieged brethren in Outremer, the Pope's original letter, supplemented by a new letter as preached by Bernard of Clairvaux, um, offered those, and this was new, offered those who took the cross remission of their sins, protection of their property, and other privileges. Now, some of that had been implicit during the First Crusade, but now it's becoming crystallized in church law, in, in the canon law, and in theology, that if one went on crusade, it was a way of paying the price for your sins. At a time when people believed in hell and heaven and that sin would get you on the road to hell and not on the road to heaven, and that you as a knight lived an inherently sinful life, you were forever killing people, you were forever living it up in your castles, right? you were forever engaged in in gift giving and all kinds of material things that were uh, deemed to be sinful. And so these people had a great deal of angst, to use a very modern psychological term. They didn't want to give up being knights and fighters, warriors, and they didn't want to go to hell. And how can they square the circle? Well, the Crusades offer you a way of fighting for God and the church that will not only be legitimate, i.e. not sinful, but will get you forgiveness for your sins as well. And the other concern that lords and knights had was if they were over in Outremer, in the Holy Land, their neighbor might grab their property, take their land, right? But the church then promised to protect that property, 
to excommunicate or impose a ban on those who grabbed um, the property of crusaders. So you can see how the institution is evolving to facilitate the participation of armed laymen uh, in, the, um, in the crusades. And this also applied, as we will see, uh, to the crusades ultimately in Iberia and in the Baltic. Um, and in fact, we can think of these as a kind of three-front campaign to defend and expand Latin Christendom, um, sharing this idea that crusades are different from other wars because they're called by the Pope and because they have the spiritual, the spiritual dimension, the spiritual rewards, and also one's uh, all too mundane and earthly property is protected as well. Um, that's the glue that holds these three or four kinds of crusading together. Now, I need to press on here. Um, the response to uh, Bernard's uh, preaching of this uh, new crusade was an extraordinary mobilization of the armed laity of the Latin world. In 1147, two massive armies, one under the, king, the leadership of King Louis VII of France and the other under Conrad III of Germany, embarked uh, overland on the overland routes through Byzantine Greece and Anatolia, what is now Turkey, to Syria. So they weren't taking the, the sea route along the Mediterranean. They were uh, traveling overland through um, really the Byzantine Empire in what is now Greece and what is now Turkey. Now, despite the tremendous enthusiasm generated by the venture, however, the sad reality from the church's perspective, at least, was that these crusader armies were simply not up to the task of taking on the Muslims threatening Outremer. Against the backdrop of political maneuvering amongst the French and German and Byzantine leaders, the Seljuk Turks inflicted a crushing defeat on Conrad's army, Conrad being the uh, German emperor at Doryleum, and on Louis's army at Laodicea, both in Asia Minor, again, what is now Turkey, sometimes called Anatolia. Now, despite the clear danger posed by the unification of Egypt and Syria under Saladin in 1174, uh, the resulting demoralization and disillusionment mooted the possibility of a major crusade to the east for the better part of a generation, right? So they had high hopes for these two crusades led by these two kings. And it, it, both of these expeditions, as they were also called, um, were defeated in detail. And that really demoralized the Latin Christians. The miracle of the first crusade is now juxtaposed and compared unfavorably to the abysmal failure of what we now, with the perspective of posterity, would call the second crusade. The next phase in the history of the crusades, um, uh, Riley Smith calls the coming of age period. So we've had the birth period, then we've had adolescence, and now we've got the coming of age. And this era uh, begins with the fall of Jerusalem to Saladin in 1187, and ends with its restoration to Latin Christendom in 1229. A short-lived restoration to Latin Christendom, by the way. It didn't last very long at all. Now, above all else, this phase was characterized by a profound change uh, in geopolitical purpose. During this period, the Crusades were no longer prosecuted in defense of Jerusalem, but in the, in the cause of its recovery for Latin Christendom. After the failure of the Second Crusade, the Jihad against the Christian principalities provided both a common goal and a unifying religious focal point for the Muslim powers in the region. And building on this, Zengi, about whom we've all just heard, his son and successor, Nur al-Din, uh, first created a unified Syrian emirate and then entered into an alliance with Egypt for the express purpose of putting pressure on the Christian principalities or powers. Now on his death, the vizier on the death of uh, al-Din, uh, the vizier of Egypt, Saladin, who will figure quite prominently um, in, the, um, in Hollywood movies, um, this third crusade, which I'm about to talk about, is the crusade of Robin Hood, by the way. Um, which is how it's entered into our collective consciousness in a way that I think, other than the first crusade, none of the other crusades really figure all that prominently. 
Saladin invades Syria and creates for the first time a truly unified Muslim principality surrounding Outremer. So if you think of the map of the region, Egypt, um, the hinterland, what the British would call Transjordan, um, and of course, um, what is now Leb Lebanon and Syria, these are all in the hands of Muslim, of, of a Muslim power headed by Saladin. And this is unprecedented. And it's unprecedentedly terrifying to the crusader states. Um, I don't think they quite saw the writing on the wall, but they had, had they been just a little more prescient, they would have. Now, once Saladin consolidated his power uh, over his empire, his new empire, he resumed the jihad against the crusader principalities. And there's a huge debate about how, um, how much Saladin was motivated by religious zeal or just empire building, a very mundane kind of uh, motivation. Um, but whatever his personal motivation, he was able to use the discourses and the symbols of jihad to mobilize the Islamic world in ways that it simply hadn't been since at least 1099. Now, after a somewhat checkered period marked by a few notable victories and several serious defeats, and at a point when Christians were exceptionally weak and divided, Saladin's army attacked the town of Tiberias, again, an important Christian outpost. And when the Christian army marched to relieve the besieged citadel, Saladin caught them in a highly unfavorable position and inflicted a devastating defeat upon them. This was the Battle of Hattin, which um, is one of those battles that pops whenever you talk about the Crusades, to the extent that people have heard about specific battles. The Battle of Hattin figures quite prominently. And indeed, it should. It's an inflection point, it's a turning point, and it lives on really in, at least in, into the 1900s, it lived on in, in the West's, Europe's, Latin Christendom's collective memory. Of, of the Crusades. The majority of the massive Christian host was killed or captured, including the King of Jerusalem, the master uh, of the temple, the head of the Knights Templar, and many other important leaders. And as significantly, the true cross, the cross upon which Christ was crucified, which had been recovered during the First Crusade. Nobody really knows the veracity of this. There are enough relics of the true cross to make several crosses, and they still are circulating um, throughout Latin and uh, Greek uh, Christendom. Um, but this was felt to be a part of a shard of the true cross. And it was typically carried into battle by the King of Jerusalem. It was a rallying point, was what we would now call a force multiplier. Um, people would fight even harder, knowing they were fighting for that true cross and all that it represented. It was captured by Saladin at the Battle of Hattin and paraded upside down, he was dragged through the streets of Damascus by a donkey, um, by the victorious Muslims. You can imagine how news of this resonated in the Christian world. But perhaps more importantly, all of those warriors who had fought and died or been captured and then sold into slavery were the exact forces that were manning all the other citadels, all the other fortresses and castles throughout Outremer, those were basically denuded of their best fighting men, including Jerusalem, which fell to Saladin's forces uh, on October the 2nd, 1187. By the time Saladin was finished his campaign, Outremer had been reduced to little more than a couple of coastal or a few coastal enclaves. And this is important. Tripoli, Antioch, and Tyre. On October 29, 1187, Pope Gregory VIII responded to these catastrophic developments in Itremer by issuing a new encyclical or letter, Audita Tremendi. And this one called upon the princes, the nobles, and knights of Latin Christendom to launch an expedition to liberate Jerusalem once again. Not to defend it, not to recapture Edessa, but to liberate Jerusalem once again. And remember how large Jerusalem looms in the spiritual and geopolitical imagination of uh, what we now call Western Europeans. It's huge. So the fact that they are looking to liberate it once again is very mobilizing. Now the encyclical began by characterizing the disastrous fall of Jerusalem 
as punishment for the collective sinfulness of all Christendom. The city had been lost, so the Pope argued, publicly and forcefully, because of the sins of Christians everywhere. Um, a, a, a rallying cry that probably wouldn't resonate very much today. This being the case, the encyclical continued, the redemption and liberation of the holy, holy sites necessarily required penitential sacrifice by Christians everywhere. In effect, the Pope called on Latin Christendom to redeem itself through acts of contrition, piety, and purification, including participation in an expedition to liberate Jerusalem. In practical terms, the encyclical also sought to facilitate the, such an expedition by imposing a seven-year truce throughout Latin Christendom, uh, with the goal, of course, of mobilizing princes and nobles um, who otherwise um, uh, might be um, thoroughly engaged in mortal combat with their neighbors having nothing to do with, and in fact, undermining the crusade. Um, and in that encyclical, the Pope also offered once again the now usual indulgences, privileges, and protections in exchange for their penitent participation in what was always called in, in the day an armed pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Uh, the response to Gregory's call was the largest military enterprise in the Middle Ages. Richard I, whom we refer to as Lionheart of England, Philip II, whom we refer to as Philip Augustus of France, and Frederick I of the Holy Roman Empire, who goes by the moniker Barbarossa, all led vast armies to the Holy Land. Once again, however, the campaign was to prove ill-fated. Frederick drowned en route, crossing a river, not even the glory of combat, leaving only a rump force under the command of Duke Leopold IV of Austria to press on. So many, many of the Germans just turned around and went back home at this point. So now we have a diminished crusader force um, uh, of, uh, comprised of uh, the forces of Philip of France and Richard of England. And of course, uh, there, are, there were divisions among these three crusade leaders, the Leopold IV, um, and the French and English kings. Um, and these led to the departure of Leopold and Philip from the Holy Land in the year 1191. So the squabbling between the Germans, the French, and the English resulted in uh, the Germans and the French simply upping stakes and going home. And Philip, of course, was engaged in and a struggle for mastery of what is now France, but a big chunk of which was under the feudal control of the King of England. So he went back to try to push um, the English into the sea, as it were, uh, and left the English King to do the, the heavy lifting in the Holy Land. So this left only Richard, which he did ably and some notable military successes against Saladin. Began his campaign, the Latin Kingdom comprised little more than a handful of coastal cities and one or two inland fortresses which were isolated and which would likely have fallen uh, in the not too distant future. When he had finished, he being Richard, it consisted of the whole coast from Tyre to Jaffa, right? so pretty much the entire coast of what is now Israel. Uh, however, while Richard had effectively reversed almost all of Saladin's gains since the Battle of Hattin, he was able neither to break the Sultan's army nor force him to abandon Jerusalem. The best he could manage was a negotiated settlement that guaranteed unarmed Christian pilgrims access to the holy sites, but that left uh, Jerusalem uh, in Muslim hands. Having achieved a geopolitical or military victory, however, and having created the conditions necessary for the kingdom of Jerusalem to survive for another century, Richard quit the Holy Land in 1192. He was trying to get back to deal with Philip, um, but as a kind of aside, he was arrested by the Holy Roman Emperor and languished uh, in prison um, for some years, which is where King John and Robin Hood and that whole story comes into focus. But that for another day, perhaps.
Now, while Richard's uh, campaign against Saladin was in some ways remarkably successful, from the church's perspective, it was a manifest failure because it failed to achieve the goals articulated in Adita Tremendi. To be certain, the Crusader principalities had been restored and their strategic position greatly enhanced. But as Thomas Madden, another very well-known crusade historian puts it, the purpose of these states was the protection of the holy sites. They were not an end in themselves. So Richard had in fact restored a defensive buffer rather for a Jerusalem which was no longer in Christian hands but in Muslim hands. And it was judged, the expedition therefore, what we call the Third Crusades, Crusade was judged to be a failure. Indeed, to the papacy and many of Latin Christen, Christendom's temporal leaders, Richard's inability to liberate Jerusalem from Saladin's grasp was a crushing setback, and one that needed to be uh, reversed at the earliest possible opportunity. Now, um, I'm going to compress uh, some of the history here um, because there are a number of crusades in which the Europeans attempted to retake uh, Jerusalem. They all failed with one exception. In 1244, um, it was restored at Jerusalem and the holy sites were re restored not by military action, but by diplomacy. You know, again, the diplomatic infighting and, and cross-civilization alliances and whatnot made for a very fluid situation uh, in, in Utremer in the Holy Land. The uh, Holy Roman Emperor was able to um, manipulate uh, various factions to secure for himself a truce, which, part of which was that um, Christian pilgrims would be allowed to visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, for example, and other holy sites. Now, the, uh, I want to fast forward a little bit to um, what Riley Smith calls the third phase of crusading in the Holy Land. And he refers to this, this as its maturity. Uh, one might also refer to it as its senescence um, because things start to go downhill pretty quickly. Um, it began with the expiration of Frederick. Frederick was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, the expiry of his truce in 1139 and ended with the fall of the last remnant of Utremer, the city of Acre in 1291. So there's a truce. Uh, Frederick secures access to Jerusalem. It's sort of in Christian hands, but not really. And it, the truce expires. Right. Now, the opening act of this final, um, final phase uh, involved the occupation of the defenseless city of Jerusalem by the forces of the Muslim Emir of Karak in 1239. So the uh, treaty expires. Right? Um, part of that treaty insisted that the Christians, although they control Jerusalem, they were not allowed to fortify it or station uh, significant uh, military forces there. So once the treaty had expired, um, it was ripe for the picking. And uh, once that truce expired, the Muslim Emir of Karak uh, took Jerusalem with very little effort. Now, against the backdrop of internecine conflict in the Muslim world, over the next two years, minor crusader armies were able to play Muslim factions off against each other, and thereby securing the return of the city of Jerusalem and greatly extending the frontiers of the kingdom of Jerusalem. This was so the Theobald's crusade, um, uh, which might make for an interesting lecture in and of itself. Um, I've written a fair bit about that, and it is truly an interesting crusade and one that nobody has ever heard of. But the regional balance of forces soon shifted again, and the Muslims retook the defenseless city in 1244 forever. They massacred the Christian inhabitants, they burned the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, um, and they were never again to surrender um, Jerusalem to the Christian host. This set the stage, though, for the final three acts in this phase. The Seventh Crusade, led by King Louis IX. Um, uh, King Louis decided he was going to take the indirect approach, and he um, led a massive army to Egypt, where he occupied Damietta and was advancing on Cairo. Now, Egypt is the true source of wealth in the Muslim empire. 
and between Egypt and Syria and points farther north and east um, lay these crusader kingdoms. And when they were at their best, the crusaders would take the city of Ascalon, which was a key linchpin in the trade routes between Egypt and Syria. And so Louis thinks he's going to really en enhance his leverage if he can take Egypt, he can trade it for Jerusalem and the Holy Land. Alas, from Louis's perspective, it was not to be so. Muslim resistance began to stiffen, but more importantly, I think there was an outbreak of dysentery, another plague or pandemic within the Crusader army, and that turned the tide. Louis was forced to withdraw towards his base at Damietta. Um, additional Muslim successes soon rendered his position untenable, and um, he surrendered his forces to the Sultan of Egypt on April the 6th in 1250. So that's the Seventh Crusade, abject failure, but novel in its indirect approach. The Eighth Crusade, launched in 1270, was uh, King Louis' second attempt to liberate the holy uh, sites. And this time he adopted a three-step strategy. First, attack Tunis. If you look at your map, that seems a little strange. Second, though, advance along the North African coast and take Egypt. Egypt is his one big idea. And then, either by the use of military force or more likely through the use of diplomacy, um, liberate Jerusalem. Now, at first, and this is often the case, the expedition, the crusade went well. Carthage fell to Louis in July of 1270. A Sicilian fleet led by Charles of Anjou uh, was nearing the port with reinforcements that would allow the King of France to exploit his initial victory, right, as he had planned all along. On August 25th, however, Louis died of dysentery. And at this point in our experience, um, there are some parallels, which I will not tease out, between plagues then and plagues now. Um, they matter. Um, but again, that's for some mythical uh, lecture in the far distant future. Uh, the crusade, once Louis was dead, was abandoned. And finally, in the aftermath of the failed Eighth Crusade, Prince Edward of England led an expedition to the Holy Land to help defend Tripoli and what was left of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which was a mere rump. This was the so-called Ninth Crusade, 1271 to 72, conventionally considered to be the last major crusade to the Holy Land. It ended when a treaty was signed between Egypt and the Kingdom of Jerusalem, and upon the death of his father, King Edward, King Henry III, Prince Edward returned home to assume the English throne. Now, it bears mentioning, uh, of course, that crusading was not the only form of war conducted by Christian powers in the Holy Land. The dynamics of political war and dynastic war and simply economic war, if you want to call it that, were clearly at work throughout the centuries long Latin political presence in Syria and Palestine. Nevertheless, and this is really the point of, of uh, this lecture, any serious account of medieval geopolitics must recognize and take into account the distinctiveness of these ecclesiastical wars. They were sui generis. They were a thing unto themselves that never existed in, in Latin Christendom before and never existed afterward, except metaphorically a crusade against drugs or a crusade to liberate um, France in 1944. But real crusades uh, went the way of the proverbial dodo bird. Now, while often intertwined, uh, with other forms of violent conflict, as they were, the crudes, Crusades were not reducible to them. Rather, as I said, they were a distinctive form of war, a unique and time-bound combination of holy war and just war that would quickly find expression in other parts of Latin Christendom. <laughs>